Okay, now the last part is on the rabbinic commentary section of our study. And I like looking at the Targum Jonathan. It's an Aramaic and a rabbinic interpretation of the book of Isaiah, and so therefore it has a very important resource for our continuing to study the book of Isaiah. And I like looking at the commentaries and the rabbinic commentaries because a lot of times they will draw out something interesting, you know, that, that we haven't thought about before, and that we can look at the scriptures from a slightly different angle and kind of grow in our, our understanding of, of God's word. And uh, so uh, that, that's the perspective I take when, when looking at the rabbinic literature. And so uh, let's look at the Targum Jonathan. Targum Jonathan, it says the following. It says, Now go write it amongst them upon a tablet and mark it upon lines of a book that it may be for a witness for them in the day of judgment forever. Isn't that interesting? Revelation chapter 20, right here, you know. Okay, so that, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not receive the instruction of, the, of the, the Torah of the Lord, who say to the prophets, prophesy ye not, and as for doctrines, teach us not the doctrine of the law, speak ye with us with signs, relate unto us various things, turn from us the right path, make us cease from tradition, and put at a distance from us the word of the Holy One of Israel." Wherefore, thus says the, the Holy One of Israel, because you have despised this word and trusted in a lie and oppression and stay upon thereon. Therefore, this sin shall be unto you as a city laid waste, made a ruinous heap, as a blending wall, who or a bending bending wall whose breaking comes very suddenly, and is and its breaking shall be as the breaking of a potter's clay vessel, who is breaking it without compassion, and a moment among its fragments there shall not be found a pot shard. Right to take fire from the hearth or to draw water from the cistern. Okay, so the Targum translation says that the words of the testimony of the witness of judgment is to be written down so that it will testify of these rebellious people. You know, and, and this just sounds so much like the book of Revelation in chapter 20. Remember, we, we saw that just a few moments ago. Now, Rashi writes in his commentary on Chapter 30, verse 8, in part 1, he says, Engrave it, this is a prophecy. Okay, so he's speaking to the Word of God so that it will continue as a permanent thing that is preserved for a witness for each of us and for everyone. You know, And this is the whole point, the purpose of God, preserving His Holy Word for our lives, right? And the Targum, it goes on, and it says that in verse 9, 10, and 11, that this is a rebellious people, and it goes on, and they, they say to the prophets, don't prophesy to us and speak to us lies and, and whatnot, okay? And, and turn us from the way, from the path. Turn us from tradition and put a distance between us and the word of the Holy One of Israel. You know, it's a, that's an evil people, right? If you think about that, that's a, that's a pretty evil person who says those kinds of things. You know, so here Isaiah says that the people who are rebellious are those who reject the Torah of God. And the major point of these verses from the Targum is that the Tanakh is relevant for us today in regard to doctrine and truth. Now, I have talked to people years ago who believe the Old Testament is virtually irrelevant today, saying that doctrine and truth is found only in the New Testament, and that's all that's is sufficient for us. You know, and, and the interesting thing is that you try and point out that the New Testament's a commentary on the Old Testament, you know, the Tanakh, and uh, that you can't go with one without the other, especially if it's citing the other so many times as proof texts, then should we not be studying these, these proof texts to understand this commentary, right? And, and it just, it, it, oh, it's so messed up. But the idea is that uh, there is a belief today that the Tanakh is irrelevant right, for doctrine and for truth. And when talking to such people, it's like literally walking or hitting against a wall. And just like Isaiah is saying here in, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 9, you know, they, they refuse to receive the instruction of the Torah of the Lord, the law of God. And we notice something very important according to the New Testament text concerning Yeshua's words on this topic. Yeshua said that he did not come 
to abolish Torah or the prophets, but to fulfill them in Matthew chapter 5. And then he later said in Matthew 19, verse 17, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. Isn't that interesting? So when he was further asked about which commandments were the most important, he cited that loving God and loving your neighbor, right? And, and then he also cited then the Ten Commandments and appealed to this man in Matthew 19 to follow them. Okay, so in addition, he said that the scriptures testify of him in John chapter 5, verse 39, and that his followers of Yeshua, as followers, believers, we should be striving to understand what this means, you know, and how the scriptures actually testify of Yeshua. You know, what does that mean? Where is it at? You know, how, what was he talking about, right? And it's so unfortunate today that there are so many that feel this is, that this is not an important task to understand what the scriptures actually say about Yeshua, you know, from the Tanakh. You know, Ibn Ezra and Rashi, both they both say the following concerning this on Isaiah chapter 30, verse 11, regarding the people asking to be turned from their tradition to be distanced from the word of God. Okay, so right here we see Ibn Ezra, and it says, he says, get you out of the way, etc. These words are addressed by the people to the prophets. Cause the Holy One, etc., cause the mention of or, or the name of the Holy One of Israel to cease. Okay, so that, that right there. So we see Ibn Ezra is saying that this causing of the Holy One is to God and that this get you out of the way is to the prophets. Okay, and then Rashi says, turn away, turn us away. And then from the path that we want, that from the path, right? And we want false prophecy. You know, we would rather hear false prophecy. We'd rather have our ears tickled, right, rather than the truth. What were the prophets calling people to do? Turn from sin. Return to the Lord. Repent, right? And they didn't want that. They didn't want to hear it. They, they just wanted their ears tickled. You know, Ibn, Ibn Ezra states that these words from Isaiah are the people's words to the prophets. The outcome of this approach to faith is to cause the mention of God's name to cease in Israel. You know, Rashi he agrees saying that turning us away is synonymous to hearing false prophet as opposed to the truth. We note how this is the approach of those who reject Yeshua as the Messiah of God and who also reject his word, which he says in Matthew, or sorry, in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. Okay, so again, Yeshua said that they testify of him. And if this is so, we should be pressing hard to understand how this is so, searching, searching and seeking these things out. Now, the anti-missionary, however, on the other hand, chooses the presupposition that the Tenach does not speak of Yeshua and then fixes his attention only on the Peshat method of interpretation, this simple, right, in, in his attempts to justify his own presupposition. And so when we study the Torah and apply it to our lives, we're, we're actually, as believers, we're actually more able, we're able to more fully appreciate the mercy and the grace of God in sending his son Yeshua to lay his life down for ours. And we also more fully appreciate the sacrificial system and how Yeshua functions as our Kohen Hagadol. You know, we are told in Luke 24 that Yeshua explained the scriptures to his disciples, right? Remember, after the resurrection. And their hearts burned over these things that had just happened. Yeshua gave his life for theirs and then the resurrection. We also note that faith and service do not change following faith in Yeshua. We're told in the book of Acts that disciples regularly met at the temple in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 verse 46. How about John and Peter were testifying at the temple during the prayer time in Acts 3 verse 1 and how there were thousands who believed, I think 3,000 in total, and were zealous for Torah. Oh, that was... In, in Acts 3, when they preached, they, they got saved. But um, in, in Acts 21, verse 20, where the, Paul is, it's reported to Paul how there were thousands of Torah Jews, right? Torah, uh, Torah obedient, people who were zealous for the Torah, and they had faith in Yeshua there in Jerusalem, right? And in addition, the disciples were imprisoned and an angel of the Lord freed them and told them, go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life, right? And according to Acts chapter 5, verse 20. 
And we also note Paul took the Nazarite vow in Acts 20, chapter 18. He lived a Torah observant life in Acts 21 and offered sacrifices again in, in the temple in Acts 21 to conclude the Nazarite vow. We note that the sacrifices include whole burnt offering, sin offering, grain offering, etc. You know, so note that there are many more examples like this in the New Testament text, but for those for, from these short examples, we can easily see the relevance of Torah in our lives today. You know, and again, these are ignored in the modern theologies. They're just brushed over because easy i want easy you know i want easy that that's that's the the name of the game today right in the church you know there, there are those however who profess the authority of both the Tanakh and the new testament while functionally relegating the study of torah to the dust heap of history remember i mentioned before that when the importance of the the old testament right the Tanakh, and that it was like oh that's just the uh, you know it don't matter. And it's like, okay, you know, and this is the idea of relegating the study of Torah or all of the, the, the Old Testament to the dust heap of history. And this is why there are those who learn about Torah Judaism and then turn from their faith in Yeshua because they do not have a solid foundation in education in the Tanakh or in the original languages. And we note that the outcome of, of a here of this approach, Isaiah explains it according to the Targum in verse 12. He says, Wherefore, thus saith the Holy of Israel, because you have despised this word right here, and trusted in a lie and oppression, and stay thereon. Okay? You know, the anti-missionary will, oh, I'm going to say the anti-missionary, I would say the false prophet, you know, the, the one who is not of God, will despise other people. He will come down like a hammer on other people. He will break up marriages. You know, he will do these things and lord control over people. And this is exactly what Isaiah is talking about because this person is offering lip service to God. They des he despises the word of God, trusting in a lie and in oppression. Okay, I think that's key. You know, so here the idea is that one despises the word of God. And this is analogous to believing in the, also in the irrelevance of Torah for our lives today in the modern theologies of this present day. I mean, notice how despising the word is synonymous to trusting in a lie. And then oppression follows the one staying thereupon, meaning that the one, one is placed into a secure position in their hearts. They become hard. They become callous to the truth. They can't hear the voice of God. They only hear themselves, right? And again, this is a very dangerous place to be. To turn from Yeshua is to turn from the truth. The evil one does not come out or, out or at a person all at once, you know, to cause someone to fall away from faith in Yeshua. He comes very subtly in stages, little by little. And this is why it is so important that we study the scriptures. That, that is why we need to study the scriptures. We need to be in the word of God daily. And this has to be the highest priority since the scriptures are the food for the spirit. And they help us to keep in memory the mercy of God and his son, Yeshua. And so the word of God functions as a wall of protection for his people, you know, for us. You know, this is why it's so important. Now, this commentary, Lechum uh, Mati Moron, uh, 60 part 8, part 7, says the following concerning verse 12 and 14 on Isaiah. So, this is why we, he says, this is why we break an earthen vessel in the aspect of, and you put your trust in fraud and corruption, and it is shattered as one shatters a potter's mug, so that no earthen shard is left in its breakage. The trust of holiness created by the engagement is explained above is the opposite of the trust of the other side, which is in the aspect of breaking an earthen dish as explained above. In addition, we hint to the couple that if they fail to conduct themselves in holiness and betray the aspect of trust of procreation, God forgive, forbid then they will be in the aspect of breaking an earthen dish, which is caused by the trust of the unfaithful. Okay. So uh, the rabbis kind of they, they're, they're looking at this, uh, the marriage covenant here. I believe that's, that's what they're referring to here. 
So the rabbis connect the trusting in fraud and corruption to that of breaking an earthen vessel. And we note that when fraud and corruption prevail, then something useful has become completely broken, right? And just like our governmental system today and around the world, when the politicians are corrupt, they are no longer our representative of the people and the system literally becomes broken. You know, God wants us to be faithful as opposed to being unfaithful. And the broken vessel has no utility. It cannot hold anything because it's broken. And this refers to the one who is unfaithful. And the rabbis compare this to the wedding covenant. In quote from Proverbs 25, verse 19, they say, confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Okay, and we note the, the uselessness of having a, a rotten tooth. You can't eat right. You have to eat on the other side of the mouth. And then you have a foot out of joint, you can't even walk, right? And we can see this application for us today in our modern world, right? And, and Solomon, Solomon's comparison draws in this context of the truth, tooth and the foot, and there being so much pain that's associated with these things in relation to the one who is unfaithful. You know, Isaiah goes on to describe what happens to those who are unfaithful, how it leads to destruction in verse 13 and 14. And, and Targum, it says, Therefore, this sin shall be unto you as a city laid waste and made a ruinous heap as a bending wall whose breaking comes very suddenly. And in its breaking shall be as the breaking of a potter's vessel of clay who is breaking it without compassion. And among its fragments there shall be not found a pot shard to take fire from the hearth or to draw water from the cistern. Okay, so the idea of breaking a pot, the Targum draws out that when a pot is broken, there are so many pieces that remain on that there are some pieces, sorry, some pieces that remain useful. You know, for example, when a piece is large enough to scoop coals out of a fire or to draw water from a river, right? And it uses a cup. And um, here the outcome of turning from God's word and from faith, the idea is that the pieces are so small, there's absolutely no use for them outside of being tossed upon a waste dump. You know, Ibn Ezra and Rashi both describe these things in relation to the walls of the city, and they say the following. So we look at Ibn Ezra and Isaiah chapter 30, verse 13, parts 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, in the original, or in the Hebrew original, is not part of the explanation, but the first word of the new ver next verse, which is to be explained, because you trust in the money which you send to the king of Assyria, that he should not come. And this iniquity, and then they refer to Second Kings, the historical document of where that actually happened. As this iniquity shall be to you, that it is, it will destroy you. And then as a breach of falling tower, as a breach ready to fall swelling out, as a breach ready to fall swelling out, as a swelling thing of the same root in uh, Blaine's, and uh, can also be joined, this uh, Neva can also be joined with Peretz, a swelling breach. Suddenly, at an instant, the two words have nearly the same meaning. Adamat Afar, the dust of the earth. And um, this is con this construction, the combination of the two similar nouns, the one in the genitive governed by the other, is met with more frequency. And, for example, seems to suppose, it expresses a kind of superlative, um, Kedosh Kedoshim, the you know, Holy of Holies, the most holy place, uh, and then most suddenly. Okay, so Ibn, Ibn Ezra describes the walls of the city of the unfaithful as bulging out. And this means that there is some kind of weakness in the wall that allows the earth behind the wall to burst forth. Or simply the weight of the wall pressing down upon the weak spot leads to this bulging out and a swelling. And iniquity has this quality to form a weak spot where the enemy may attack. This is why the analogy of the breached wall is such a good example. You know, Rashi describes the, the walls of fortification, and it is interesting how the Word of God functions as a wall of fortification for us. You know, when one walks away from the truth of God, the enemy uses this as a point of attack and for deception. You know, the idolatry of self, right, material things, or immorality and pride, are the paths of attack that the evil one uses to keep one in bondage. You know, the Lord God and his Messiah want freedom in our lives. And this is why Midrash Tent Huma Budbar says what it does concerning these things for, are these verses from, for Israel. And that is 
right here. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, so this is this is Midrash Tin Huma Bubar Teruma Teruma, you know, Parashat Teruma um six two. Okay, so it says, uh, in other interpretation, why was it likened in, to iron and clay? Just that iron is hard, so is this wicked kingdom hard. And why is it like clay? Because the Holy One is going to break it like clay, as stated in Isaiah 30, verse 14. He shall break it as a potter's vessel is broken. Now, Daniel had seen the Messianic king, as stated in Daniel 2, 34. You know, you looked on, you looked on until a stone was cut out without the use of hands, Okay, and then what's interesting is that New Testament uses this verse within the same context, okay, of the Messianic King, and that Messianic King is Yeshua. Okay, we think about that. Okay, we find this stuff in right in the rabbinic literature. Okay, okay, so Resh Lakish said the stone is the Messianic, uh, the Messianic King, and then it struck the statue on its feet. All the kingdoms which were set in the statue now by virtue of what is the Messianic King linked to a stone. Even by virtue of Jacob, of whom, uh, of whom is the reading in in uh, Exodus seven seven is stated, from there comes the shepherd, the rock, and even of Israel. In the biblical context, these words would naturally refer to the Holy One, but the Midrash understands them as an allusion to Jacob, as does Rashi, and so also below in in nine twelve Daniel two forty five because you saw that rock even was cut from the mountain so that it consumes the whole world, as stated. And it shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And in that hour, Israel shall dwell in tranquility and security, and they shall dwell on it, their own soil and security. We note here that we see it says in it, in okay, because you saw the rock and it come, it was cut from the mountain. The rabbis say here in the Midrash that so that it consumes the whole world. And what has happened with, with Yeshua and the whole world, right? Everyone believes. This is a worldwide phenomenon, right, of who Yeshua is as the Messiah of God. And what we find right here in the Midrash is this very thing that we see has happened in the New Testament text. You know, isn't that fascinating? And so what we have is a rabbinic proof text, a rabbinic support for what we see in the interpretations of the New Testament text. You know, it doesn't take much to study these things, to find these truths, how the New Testament text is true, and how these things that, that Yeshua said speaks of him, right? The Tanakh speaks of him. Right here, the rabbis are talking about how the Tanakh speaks of him, right? The Messianic king. You know, the, the rabbis describe that this nation is both um, has both iron and clay, right? The sense of iron being wicked and hard, unwilling to listen, unwilling to repent, unwilling to be, re, to be humbled. And the clay, clay pot is analogous to the ease in which God will destroy those who live like this, right? The rabbis draw in the idea of the Messianic king from Daniel 2.34, where the Midrash interprets the stone that was cut out without the use of hands as a reference to the Messiah. You know, so they, again, this, this is the New Testament concept here. They draw this into Daniel's vision of the statue that was composed of both clay and stone. You know, so the stone that smashed the feet is a reference to the Messiah of God setting people and nations free from the bondage of, of the idolatry, you know, from bondage of self-idolatry, right? And to, to, to be able to be, to be set free, to be able to turn to God's holy ways, right? And to seek his holy, his holy ways, to seek his Messiah, the one that, that set them free, right? You know, the Midrash explains why the Messiah is likened to the stone. The explanation brings us right back to the Torah, right? Right back to Jacob. Right back to the to to the uh, the patriarchs, right in Genesis forty nine verse twenty four, where the shepherd, the rock of Israel, where the Torah context was to the Holy One God, you know. So what we see here is how the Messiah literally strikes the foundation of idolatry, or of having their root in idolatry being destroyed. You know, the concept here is to the Lord setting us free from sin, the sins of the nations, from the sin that is rooted in idolatry and bondage and hatred, right? This is the power of the Messiah of God to bring peace. And these things are consistent with the New Testament descriptions of Yeshua Hanetzaret, right? Uh, Jesus of Nazareth. You know, this is, this is why when, when I say, uh, and there was a couple studies ago where I talked about the Torah 
and the anti-missionaries and how how much anger and hatred is in their hearts, right? Torah should not cause anger and hatred in our hearts. It should cause us to love others, you know, because the two greatest commands, loving God and loving others, right? Paul talks about that. Yeshua talks about that. The disciples talk about that. Why does the anti-missionary hate so much? I mean, if, you, if, if you're an anti-missionary, think about that. Because the Torah should not elicit that kind of thing, right? God enters into our lives by His Spirit. His Holy Spirit we're indwells us, changes us from the inside, and removes this hatred. shouldn't be like that, right? And this is the point of why and the power of God and the power of the Messiah to bring peace. And these things are consistent with the New Testament descriptions of who Yeshua is, right? When we read through the scriptures, the most significant thing that God does is not the working of an external miracle, but the working, the Lord God working in the lives of his people, right? Creating us as new creatures, new creations, who are, have this great desire to walk in his holy ways. You know, the Lord works internal miracles every day to set people free from sin and bondage and idolatry, right? This means that when we have the desire to turn from sin, to repent, and to seek the forgiveness of God, and to walk in His holy ways, this is a miracle of God in our hearts. This is the kind of miracles we should be looking for in our lives every day. I believe, you know, this is a miracle I want in my life, you know, and I think you should too. You know, so um, this is what I had for the, the study for tonight on Isaiah. And for those who stayed the whole time, I appreciate that. That is fantastic. And uh, come back next week. We're going to look at the next seven verses. And thanks for listening. Bye.